Looks like a normal garden, right? Zoom in just a little. More. A little more. Okay, pan to the right. Now you're right. Bingo! What's that you're looking at? A stick? Wait a minute. Ah, there it is! Now that's what I call camouflage. The mantis is a beast in the insect world. Its preferred menu? Other insects. And birds. And frogs. Even mice. These mini machines come in many sizes and colors and are found in almost every corner of the world. Most of them are green or brown to blend in with their surroundings. But others like to put on something flashy and are always dressed for the occasion. These powerful insects are a farmer's best friend. They chomp up all the vermin and parasites, leaving the fields nice and clean. Ah, good old mantises! And look at that! It's making its way to another branch. Its large front legs act as a grappler and hook to latch onto anything that strikes its fancy. Those legs have sharp spikes on them, and getting caught in that grip would be the last place you'd want to be. And its back legs are powerful enough to lunge itself at anything tasty. There's no chance for escape. And besides looking mean, they're fast, like blink of an eye fast. They catch their daily meal without even breaking a sweat. Pretty flashy. And they don't like to waste time. They start eating their lunch while it's still alive and kicking. Mm. But enough about the mantis. Let's go down to ground level. Ooh, check out that snake in the grass. Cunning little thing. It's a small snake, only about a foot long, and it doesn't eat anything outside its strict diet. It feasts on little insects, birds, and mice. It slithers its way onto the tree, not knowing the mantis is there waiting, disguised as a twig. The mantis sees everything. It's able to turn its triangular head a full 180 degrees to get the perfect view. It has two compound eyes and three other simple eyes squeezed in between. Definitely not afraid of a little eye contact. The snake slides its way up the tree trunk and inches its way closer to the mantis. They lock eyes. The snake launches itself and bites into the mantis's leg. The mantis slips and falls down the tree. Just in time, it manages to reach out and hang onto a small tree branch and regain its balance. It sinks into its signature fighting stance. Woo, that was quick. No preparation, no warm-up, nothing. The snake slithers its way down, and once again, they're face to face. They stare at each other. Who's gonna make the first move? A mantis usually lifts its arms in the air and expands its back wings to make it look larger when it's getting threatened. Ah, remember the Karate Kid? Yeah, just like that. But not today. It's confident enough against this puny grass snake. The snake, meanwhile, doesn't know what to expect. It's never faced such an alien-like creature before. It's like a stick, but also looks delicious. Ah, confusing. After a second, the snake makes another lunge. It opens its jaws and tries to bite the mantis, but it misses. The mantis dodges easily and grabs hold of the snake's neck. It tries to take a bite, but the snake wiggles free in spite of the mantis's sharp spikes on its legs. The snake's free, but the damage is done. Those spikes penetrated the snake's thick skin. One point for Team Mantis, but the snake isn't quitting anytime soon. It surprises the mantis with a sneak move and catches it off guard. But the mantis manages to do a little hop, a little jump, and grapples the snake to the ground. And this particular mantis is snake-size hungry. TKO, if you know what I mean. The snake never had a chance. But it might not end so quickly if the mantis was facing a hornet. Now we're talking. A flying beast with a beefy stinger versus a quick-footed, clawed fighting machine. Okay, we got time. Let's do it. The mantis stands guard, motionless. It turns its head around, and all five eyes scan the sky, the ground, watching, waiting. So far, nothing. The ground is clear, and the sky is a spotless blue. Then, a quick shadow-like movement flashes across the sky. The mantis couldn't get a good look at it. Another swoosh and a flash of color, this time from behind. Something's toying with the mantis, trying to weaken it psychologically. But the insect holds its ground. A true mantis doesn't flinch. This time, the hornet flies right past it. Those buzzing wings make a sound like a mini helicopter. 
The mantis is prepared and double checks its equipment. It looks down at its front legs to make sure they're ready for anything. It's a game of patience. Who's going to show weakness first? The hornet swoops down and tries to sting the mantis. But the mantis is fast. Fast enough to move out of the way, but not quite fast enough to grab hold of the flying beast. It'll have to wait for the hornet to come around again. Then it'll be ready. The mantis needs to time this thing just right. If it can get the perfect angle, it can grab hold of the hornet and wrestle it down. But the hornet is too clever. It keeps coming in at different speeds and angles. The mantis is used to ambushing its opponent, so just waiting around to be stung isn't its favorite activity. But it's quick enough to ward off any attacks. Another flash, and the hornet surprises the mantis from behind. It knocks it down. The hornet almost engages its stinger, but just misses. The mantis sees its chance. It gets back up, but one of its back legs is damaged. This could be a huge advantage for the hornet, since the mantis needs both back legs to lunge and pounce. It wobbles around a bit, trying not to appear weak. Speed and counterattacks aren't an option anymore for the mantis. But at least the hornet isn't as quick as a snake. Even without its back legs, the mantis is still powerful. The hornet comes in from another direction and tries to sting the mantis. But the mantis shifts position and manages to escape. But as hard as it tries, it just can't grab hold of the hornet. The hornet flies up higher than ever and uses gravity to build up some serious speed. It misses again, but the impact of the diving hornet damages the mantis's other leg. It can't move. It looked like it's all over. There's no way for the mantis to escape. The hornet decides to go in for one final sting. But this time, the mantis actually grabs hold of the hornet. Without the use of its hind legs, the mantis can't seem to pin it down properly. The hornet manages to hover a little, straining to fly away to safety. The mantis's weight pulls it back down. The more they wrestle, the more the mantis's spiky front legs start to dominate. They grip the hornet tighter and tighter, digging their spikes in deeper and deeper. The mantis sees this as an opportunity to start biting the hornet. But the hornet also has powerful jaws and bites back. Meanwhile, a small little housefly watches in the background, frozen in fear. Shoo, fly! You shouldn't be here! It's dangerous! Buzz off! The scuffle breaks apart as the hornet is somehow able to escape the mantis's grip and crawl away. Crawl, not fly. The mantis was able to damage the hornet's wings. The mantis digs deep and finds a hidden energy reserve. It crawls up to the hornet and manages to grab it again, this time from behind. This way, the hornet won't be able to sting the mantis or even bite it. The hornet can see what's about to happen, and it's helpless. The mantis's claws are locked in way too tight. The mantis begins biting. It may have a smaller jaw than the average hornet, but it's quick and just as powerful. I wouldn't want to be on the other end of those jaws. The hornet tries everything, crawling, flying, jumping off the branch, but nothing works. It succumbs to the mantis's claws and its never-ending appetite. Another stunning victory for the amazing mantis. Now, aren't you glad middle school wasn't like this? No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late. Your boat hits a rock. The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. 
Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lancehead, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lanceheads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And, so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes, but there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. 
Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras, but it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal Village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun, drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. Warning! Monster ahead! Not the best thing to see written on an old wooden sign at an entrance to a rainforest you just ran into. You're a professional treasure hunter and wildlife explorer. Right now, you're being chased by some mean-looking poachers. But those guys are amateurs. You dart left, hide, then run again. Works every time. Why were those guys shouting so much? Back to business. For several years now, you've been on a quest for a pirate's chest. Inside, a 300-year-old royal medallion. And according to this old map, the chest is somewhere here, in this jungle. Chirping birds, hungry bugs, screaming monkeys, hopefully nothing too hungry. You walk to the river and freeze. Suddenly, total silence. Not a single sound anywhere except the river. Right then, the silence is broken. Something's definitely sneaking up behind you. You turn around and see a long, thick snake's body. You raise your head slowly. Two huge fangs are hanging out right above your eyes, and a long forked tongue is gently licking your nose. On the other end of the tongue is a deep, dark mouth. Looks like a black hole. You'd fit in there no problem. You take a step back and stumble over a rock. You fall. That's the last thing you remember. Then, darkness. Looks like you'll be out for a while. Time to find out what monster you just met. Meet Titanoboa, the largest snake that ever lived on Earth, and the largest land vertebrate after the dinosaurs. It's 42 feet long. That's like seven adults, or more than half a subway car. And it could weigh up to one and a half tons. All modern pythons and anacondas are descendants of this ancient reptile that lived 60 million years ago. Except for this one, apparently. This snake isn't venomous, but it uses its long fangs to grab food. And its jaw is built for business. Imagine an empty car being crushed by the Brooklyn Bridge. That's what it feels like to be a Titanoboa's afternoon snack. Back to you. The Titanoboa was about to take a closer look at you, but you fell and passed out. The huge snake wasn't expecting its lunch to be quite so willing. It sniffs your body, looks it up and down. Hmm. You're not a threat, so it doesn't need to squeeze you before... The snake opens its wide mouth and begins to swallow. Snakes have a special jaw, divided into several parts. 
They're connected by ligaments and muscles, so snakes can open their mouth up wide, like motorbike wide. But today, Titanoboa doesn't need to try so hard. Gulp. Titanoboas use their huge fangs to push food down their throats. While it's swallowing, Titanoboa likes to use saliva to grease up its lunch and make it more slippery, much easier to swallow. Bit by bit, you disappear from view. Your clothes are soaking wet at this point. A few minutes later, you've disappeared from view and the snake looks really fat. And that's when you wake up. So how do we know what would happen? Some guy in a full body protective suit actually tried to get inside an anaconda on purpose. Darkness. You open your eyes and take a deep breath. An unpleasant liquid gets in your mouth a bit and you cough. It's hard to scratch your itchy nose. You're squeezed in from all sides. Titanoboa has a super muscly throat. At first, you panic. What happened? Where are you? You scream, but no sound. It doesn't exactly smell great in there. And that's when you realize where you are. You can't see daylight anymore. Uh Uh-oh. Then you feel a weird wiggling side to side. Titanoboa's on the move. A python can digest its lunch in a matter of weeks. It all depends on the size of the food. This Titanoboa just ate a relatively small snack. Shouldn't take it more than a few hours. But there is some good news. Since you're not that big, you have at least a bit of space to wriggle around in. You reach into your pants pocket. Your clothes, your hands, they're soaking wet. Nasty. Of course, everything else you brought with you is soaked also. Your map, matches, granola bar. Also, there's not that much air inside a massive snake. You need to conserve oxygen. Finally, you pull out your waterproof flashlight. It still works. Looks like a tiny red room. No doors, no windows. Then it hits you. Your phone! You can just reach it. The screen's cracked, but it still works. But you've only got 4% battery. And there's no signal. You think about the signal flare strapped to your ankle. The ones you use to light up a dark cave and stuff. But you can't reach it. You put all your strength into bending your knees, but you just can't. Suddenly, you notice that you've stopped moving. Snakes like to crawl to a safe resting place after eating a large meal. That's when it starts releasing more enzymes to help it digest its prize. You've got one shot to reach the flare. You need to relax your whole body. You stop moving and start to breathe slowly. You feel the walls around you start to relax too. You have one second to bend down and reach for the flare. You go for it. Your hand slides down your leg, past the knee, almost there. You reach your ankle, but there's nothing there. It must have come loose while you were running through the rainforest. A few hours pass. You're well inside Titanoboa's stomach. Snakes have powerful enzymes that can digest all parts of an animal, so it wouldn't have problems dealing with clothes and shoes. You feel around with your hands. Maybe you can find something to help you. A bone from a previous meal? anything. Your fingers graze over something, a hard round object. You manage to get the flashlight on it. No way! It's the royal medallion you've been hunting for! This Titanoboa must be way older than you thought. It must have had a tasty pirate snack about 300 years ago. How did this snake survive so long? Good diet? Plenty of exercise? There's no chance of escape. You decide to write a final message on your phone. Maybe someone will find it after this whole thing is over. You write that you love your family and have lived a happy life full of adventures. You start to cry, not out of sadness, well, a little bit, but mostly because the enzymes are stinging your eyes. It's done. You put your phone back in your pocket and clutch the medallion tight. You found it! How awesome are you right now? You close your eyes and start feeling kind of sleepy. Then, your phone buzzes. Someone sent you a text. That means you finally got a signal. You call for help and tell them you've been swallowed by a huge snake. You're saved. But they don't believe you and hang up. Just another prankster. You call back, but your battery's done for. A moment later, the snake begins to move again. You hear strange noises coming from outside. What's going on? You can feel the snake's muscles tense up, like it's getting ready to make a dash for it. A few seconds pass, and then the snake suddenly relaxes. You hear human voices. You try to shout, but you're inside a snake. So like, wham, 
A human hand grabs your head. Another hand grabs you by the shoulder and starts to pull. Someone came for you. You pass through the throat, and after a couple of minutes, the darkness disappears and sunlight hits your eyes. You're saved. Why did you run away from us? We were trying to warn you. Whoa, that guy looks real familiar. Oh, it's that guy who was chasing you earlier. Turns out he wasn't a poacher, he was a local guide. Apparently, locals are always pulling lost tourists out of Titanoboa's stomach. They usually just give the snake something to make it sleepy, then pull, pull, pull. You hug your saviors and thank them for their help. You're never going back to that rainforest, that's for sure. A smile spreads over your face, and you reach into your pocket to feel that sweet gold medallion. No! It must have fallen out! That means it's still stuck in the snake's stomach. You look at the rescuers and ask, You mind if I pop back in there real quick? Back in 2009, people in Ishikawa, Japan, saw a kind... and as large as a watermelon. During the night, you can see dozens and sometimes even thousands of fireballs. Scientists don't have any solid explanation why it happens, but it's probably flammable gas released by the marshy environment. Still, a local superstition claims it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Tornadic water spout is a tornado that doesn't occur on land, but on water. The speed of the tornado can be really high. The water is collected and partially pulled up. It manages to pull fish and even turtles up into the air. Actually, raining fish can also be explained by this weather phenomenon. 
The same might happen on the snow, too, but it's really rare. There are only six pictures of snow spouts, four of which were taken in Ontario. This weather phenomenon requires that the water is warm enough to produce fog while the air temperature is really cold, next to impossible. Lava is red, sky is blue, I'm on bright side, and so are you. Okay, I made that up. But the part about the lava being red can change. That's true, especially if you see the lava flowing from Kauai Jen volcano located in Indonesia. It has a typical red color during the day, but at night, it turns luminescent blue. No mystery behind it, just tons of sulfuric acid. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. But you probably already guessed that you should never ever do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, and it's the largest blue fire in the world rising up to 16 feet. In some places, water may look like glass. White salt ponds might look like windows or even portals to the world underneath. They have their look because of salt evaporation, and such lakes can be found in France and India. But the Cargill salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area look even crazier because of vibrant colors. The shades vary. It can be deep blue, grass green, orange, crimson, vermilion, and even magenta. The color difference is all about the different levels of salinity and tiny microorganisms living in those ponds. On the shore of the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad District, Russia, There's an enigmatic national park called Dancing Forest. The pine trees are all crooked and twisted there. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted to make the dune sand in that area a bit more stable. It's probably the unstable sand that made those trees twist that way. Another reason why those trees are so crooked might be strong winds. Some people claim it has something to do with supernatural powers. They say this forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet. Locals believe if someone climbs through one of the rings in those trees, it'll add an extra year to this person's life. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals crazy since the 1990s. Low-frequency hum doesn't let you sleep normally. Even though scientists tried so hard to find the source of the hum, they failed. They blamed it on mechanical devices and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was related to toadfish. Different variations of hum were also heard in the UK, Australia, and in some areas of the United States. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. Not to lessen clouds, or simply night clouds, are so rare because 1. They only form in summer, and 2. They can only be seen at latitudes between 50 and 70 degrees both north and south. To see those clouds, the sun should be already below the horizon, but the clouds still have to be in sunlight. It's possible for the highest clouds in the atmosphere, which are located about 50 miles up. We can't see them during the day because they're too faint. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are the enigmatic rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. Scientists can't explain why these fungi can form nearly perfect circles. But the superstition claims that fairy dances would burn the ground causing mushrooms rapid growth. In fact, it's partially true. The mushrooms grow in places where a grass withered. The Amazon River, one of the longest on our planet, stretches for 4,000 miles which is more than a drive from Vienna to New Delhi. But there's one river in South America that beats the Amazon River twice. First, it's wider. Second, nobody ever saw it. It's an Amazon underwater twin called the Hamza River, and it runs 2.5 miles underneath. Scientists found it 10 years ago, back in 2011. Don't blink, or you'll miss this rarest weather phenomenon. Red sprites are electrical discharges in the sky that look a bit like an aurora. It's super powerful, about 10 times stronger than any regular lightning, but it lasts just a couple of seconds. They were first photographed in 1989, and there are still very few photos and video recordings of this lightning. To make a video that can clearly show red sprites, it should be at about 7,000 frames per second. Well, I'm out. Snakes, crocodiles, big lizards. Eh, Not exactly a big deal. I mean, I guess they're less scary in pic... Ah! Whoa, I take it back. Crocodile monitors are the only reptiles, other than snakes, of course, that have forked tongues. No, we're not counting telemarketers. Somehow, that tongue helps them pick up delicious scents. 
Oh, and they're also called tree crocodiles. So if you ever thought you'd be safe up in a tree if you got chased by a crocodile, better think again. They're full of surprises, including impressive tree climbing skills. They're quite aggressive, and luckily, they live far, far away, somewhere in the mountains of New Guinea. It may not be the giant dragon you saw in that fantasy movie last week, but the Komodo dragon is scary in its own way. The biggest living lizard even has its own island named after it. If you're ever in Indonesia, 300 pounds, 10 feet long, definitely worth a look, up from a distance. This lizard tends to dig a huge hole where it lays its eggs. As soon as the younger ones gain some strength, they run away from home and climb up the nearest tree. Not because they're being rebellious, more to avoid being eaten. Yep, they don't have the best parents in the world since, well, Komodo dragons sometimes eat other Komodo dragons. So, yeah. This turtle is all about breaking stereotypes. It looks like a dinosaur tried to crash the annual turtle Halloween party. A ridged shell, rough skin, and an insanely strong bite. Definitely not your average turtle. They live in swamps and freshwater lakes and are definitely the largest and meanest looking of all snapping turtles out there. They're also the heaviest. The biggest one ever found weighed almost 250 pounds. Because of the algae growing on their shells, you might think you're looking at some sort of oddly shaped rock sticking out of the water. Finally, a scary movie starring a turtle as a bad guy. They walk at night and will literally eat everything they find. I'm talking snakes, opossums, water birds, squirrels, other turtles, and this is the impressive part, even some smaller alligators. I don't know if I'm ever going to swim in a lake again. (coughs) Snake time, beady little eyes, crazy colored skin. Yeah, that's not the case with a Madagascar blind snake. These small reptiles look like skinny pink worms, and you're not exactly going to stumble across them in the wild. They live underground. And yes, they have really poor vision. They can only see blurry shapes and shadows. That's why they mainly hunt by smell. Blind snakes in general can grow up to a foot long, and they live on all continents except Antarctica. And speaking of snakes, I just can't leave out the cobra. Yellow, black, striped, so many patterns and colors. But there's one, you better hope you never meet her. The queen, the red spitting cobra. This one won't bite you to inject its venom. It's got a bit more of a rude approach. It contracts the muscles around its venom gland and spits some out right into your face. It seems like a way scarier tactic than a regular old bite, but there's a catch. This cobra's venom doesn't work if it falls on your skin or even gets into your mouth. For things to get really nasty, it has to get into your eyes. Poof. I mean, it's not like animals have such an amazing aim that they can nail you in the eye while you're running away, right? Well, there was an experiment, and those spitting cobras managed to hit a researcher's goggle-covered eyes 10 out of 10 times. Speaking of snakes, no way. Speaking of turtles, okay, snake-neck turtles, I got it eventually. When you see one roaming around, you might think it's a snake that's borrowing its buddy's house while it's out of town. But no, this turtle's neck is almost half its total size. How awesome would we look with necks like that? Eh, no thanks. They mostly chill in wetlands or swamps. Some of them are also known as stinkers, like me. And you can find out why if you catch one having a bad day. They can launch their stinky spray more than 3 feet. Well, that beats me. Pac-Man frogs, named after the greatest game ever, according to that weird guy you met at the grocery store, have round, plum bodies with pretty big stomachs and mouths. They come in different colors, including apricot, strawberry, and albino. So, red, yellow, and white, I guess. They're pretty lazy and not into climbing or even moving. They do have teeth, though, and they won't hesitate to bite if you touch them. Luckily, they're not poisonous, but it probably wouldn't feel that good to have a frog hanging from your finger. No, I guess it wouldn't. This is a gharial, one of the strangest and most unique crocodiles out there. Check out that ridiculous snout. But it does come in handy when it's trying to catch fish. Unlike crocodiles that stalk and then lunge at their prey, gharials sense vibrations in the water. Then they whip their heads from side to side 
then it's sushi time! Their jaws have more than 100 teeth. Gharials prefer to stay in the water most of the time, but sometimes they go out to chill if it's sunny enough. Just give them a clear freshwater river and they'll be happy. Yeah, no need to tell me twice. Lizards, snakes, frogs… Step aside please, turtles are slowly but surely taking over this video. Strap yourselves in for the pig-nosed turtle. It's another freshwater turtle, this time with a long snout, complete with two big nostrils. It gets its name because… duh. That sweet snout allows it to breathe while the rest of its body stays underwater. That way, it can keep its body hidden. It's safe from any underwater danger, too, since its belly looks sort of like the reflections made by nearby trees. It may look funny, but this turtle's had its own camouflage tactics and totally unique look for the last 140 million years. That's way before the dinosaurs went extinct. The leaf-nosed snake has a quite elongated body and a bizarre nose that looks kind of like a bendy leaf. Okay, so this Pinocchio snake comes from Madagascar and lives in trees. And you might easily mistake it for a branch. This snake chills during the day and goes out at night to find itself some delicious smaller reptiles, frogs, and even birds. Picture yourself on a sandy tropical beach. The sea, coconuts, palms, and iguanas? Yeah, these guys hang out everywhere. In the sand, up trees, on walls… They live all the way from Mexico to Brazil and love to chill anywhere sunny. It's not just a relaxing hobby. They need the sunlight for its vitamin D, which helps them absorb more nutrients from their food. And no worries, iguanas aren't dangerous as long as they don't feel threatened. If they do, well, luckily they're not venomous. But they do have sharp teeth that can cause some serious discomfort. Oh, and you know how those smaller lizards lose their tail when they get stuck or when you step on them? The same thing happens to iguanas. A legless lizard is a reptile that's always getting mistaken for a snake. It actually lost its legs and arms, not overnight of course, but through millions of years of evolution. Snakes lost their legs and arms even earlier. Still, there are real differences between them. If you get up close and personal with a legless lizard, you'll see that it blinks. But snakes, on the other hand, they don't even have eyelids. They protect their eyes with see-through membranes. Snakes actually have shorter tails, while legless lizards, well, they're mostly tail. Now you're totally ready for next Monday's Quiz Night, Reptile Edition. Gotta say it again, turtles are rocking this video. And this time, I mean literally. Merry River turtles look just awesome. It's not like you see a reptile with a green mohawk every day. But this little turtle has a secret. That's not its natural hair. It's actually algae. Ooh, slimy. And now for some breaking news. All snakes have suddenly disappeared. If you saw this on the news, what do you think would happen? Well, Voldemort certainly wouldn't be pleased to hear this, and neither would other Slytherin members. Hogwarts would have three houses instead of four. Parseltongue, which is the language of serpents, would become useless. Okay, Potterheads, let's get back to our muggle world. How would it affect us? Well, let's look at the bright side first. People with ophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes, would be so relieved. We can all agree that snakes aren't exactly everyone's favorite animal. Some snakes are venomous, and this doesn't help save their reputation. It's often overlooked that these animals usually prefer to retreat when you encounter them. They can become defensive if threatened, but when left alone, they don't want to mess with you. Try telling this to people with a phobia, though. Now they can enjoy outdoor activities, such as mountain climbing, like everyone else. And yet, they would have other worries in the absence of these serpents. The design of the ecosystem works like a clock. Every species has an important role. If one goes down, the others will be affected. Snakes are no exception to this order. They primarily snack on mice or rats. They help to control rodent and other small mammal populations. 
This is important in terms of preventing the spread of diseases, too. Think about the spread of the plague of medieval times. Driving out all reptiles could cause a similar problem. Did you know that the bubonic plague was never completely gone? It's been spotted in modern times, too. For instance, in Madagascar in 2008. So it's good to have some snakes around to protect us from disease outbreaks. You see, snakes are excellent hunters. They ambush their prey by using their highly developed senses to find and track their potential dinner. They're super mobile, can squeeze through cracks, climb on rock walls, and swim. They can even fly. Well, sort of. Flying snakes can't actually gain altitude, but they can glide. They use the speed of free fall and contortions of their bodies to follow air flows and lift themselves. Yeah, they can catch their prey in numerous ways. If we imagine a world without them, it will lead us to another phobia. Allow me to introduce you to musophobia. It's the fear of mice and rats. People with this phobia will have a hard time with all those rats wandering around since there are no snakes to eat them. Not to mention that a single pair of rats can have a million descendants in over a year. Say hello to crop damage. An overpopulation of rodents can lead to a shortage of food and competition for resources. Do I feel the Hunger Games vibes? Oh, and mice wouldn't be our only problem. You can add insects to the list too. Again, without snakes, they'll throw a party in the streets. Reptiles also play an important role in the natural environment and food webs as prey. Mongooses, eagles, and hawks would really miss snakes. Eventually, some populations of large mammals would decline, and this could lead to the extinction of some species. Then there's medicine. Scientists and researchers would miss these creatures. Snake venom is the key to the development of certain medicines. For example, some diabetes and heart disease medicines have been derived from snake venom. Patients who need them will get affected, too. When we mention snakes and medicine, there's something else that comes to mind. Botox. Is it really snake venom? Nope. Snake venom used in skin care isn't obtained from the animal itself. It turns out that this ingredient is called snake. It's a human-made ingredient designed to mimic the effects of temple viper snake venom. Now let's picture what life would really look like without snakes. I'm starting with day one. People don't immediately notice the absence of these creatures. So, in the first few days, especially in cities, people would have no clue that all snakes are gone. Workers in zoos could start to panic. You would see some news about snakes missing from zoos. Then people in zoo administrations would go through CCTV footage. They would be shocked to see that snakes disappeared into thin air. After the spread of this news, authorities would probably open special departments to see if they have any snakes left in their country. Then it would turn into a worldwide issue. Some sort of a global alliance would be established to investigate what happened to these reptiles and what could be done about it. By the time authorities and people understood the severity of the situation, ecosystems would already start to change. People who live in urban environments may not be directly affected in the first few months. Then they would see more mice in their houses and in the streets. Around 500,000 mice live in the network of tunnels of the London Underground, for example. The number may vary, but many rodents live in large cities. These animals would become more visible. You'd open a kitchen cabinet and, oops, you'd see a mouse looking at you from behind a jar of peanut butter. New career opportunities would arise since the demand to live in a mouse-free environment would skyrocket. Authorities might introduce new taxes to raise money to handle this new situation. After all, they would need to provide people with safe places to live. Of course, it would be not only urban places that would be affected by the absence of snakes. The countryside would have even more problems. 
without snakes, the number of pests would increase. These animals would start destroying crops and habitats of other animals, and farmers would be in serious trouble. Authorities would need to support people living there and find ways to protect the environment, which would be their top priority. Researchers and scientists would have to take a huge responsibility. Maybe they'd create artificial snakes that could be nutritious like real snakes, so that animals like eagles would hunt them and continue to live. What artificial snakes would look like is a mystery. I can't imagine them. I'll just leave it to you. If we flashed forward to five years from the first day of the world without snakes, we would face an entirely different world. Maybe we would have a special day for it, the fifth anniversary of the world without snakes. The changes would be obvious, but by that time, people would have probably got used to living in that different world. Some restaurants would have already made changes to their menus. Goodbye to snake soup. Then there would be new museums dedicated to snakes. You'd be able to read about the story of their evolution and see their fossils. Maybe you'd stop by the museum souvenir shop to buy a snake-shaped pen for your friend. Lastly, we would still be looking for alternatives to snake venom in the field of medicine. I mean, it's a relief for people who show allergic reactions to snake bites, but these animals are crucial for some studies and medicines. So, researchers would still be busy trying to find alternatives that could replace snake venom. If we went 200 years ahead in time, we would see a world where people have fully accepted that snakes are gone for good. So much so that younger people would only know that there was an animal named a snake that once lived on this planet. They would get to know this animal from history books and videos. Coloring books would have a cat or a dog, but not a snake. Mythical creatures like Medusa and Shamaran would become even more mystical and interesting. Oh, and we wouldn't compare a sneaky person to a snake anymore. There would be a new definition for them. We've survived the Ice Age, meteorites, and many other challenges, so we'll probably figure something out. Fingers crossed that this scenario never gets real, though. Do you have any other version of how events could unfold in a snakeless 